Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. This is the fifth of the 2021 PGS webinar series that we launched last January. My name is Oni Martinez, and I will be your host for tonight's session. Aside from welcoming our participants here in our vir virtual webinar room, uh, we also wish to greet everyone watching us uh, with our live streaming at YouTube and those who have joined us tonight through our other social media platforms. Tonight's talk is entitled Chuck Bands and Chuck Beds, The Politics of Waiting in the Port of Manila. And I will introduce our guest speaker for tonight shortly. But before that, let's briefly go over the house rules for tonight's session. During the presentation, attendees will be on mute, but we encourage you to interact with our speaker and other attendees of uh, this session by typing your comments and your questions in the chat box, you will find the chat box at the low uh, right side of your window, the Zoom window, or through our social mm. media accounts in Twitter, Facebook, and also in YouTube. Questions will be addressed during the open forum, which happens later in the program. This lecture is also being simultaneously streamed in the UP Department of Geography YouTube channel. Also, please note that this meeting is being recorded and it will be available for viewing after the event. If you have any concern in this regard, you can send us a private message through the chat box too. And uh, just to give you a heads up, we will be taking a group photo before we end this webinar. So please be ready to turn on your video, your camera uh, for that part of our program. To formally start this session, I would like to call Professor Eman Garcia, the President of the Philippine Geographical Society, to give the opening remarks. Thank you, Oni. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us again for another episode of the Philippine um, Geographical Society Lecture Series 2021. It is with pleasure that I welcome everyone on behalf of the Philippine Geographical Society and the UP Department of Ge Geography in this evening's event. The PGS Lecture Series is part of our objectives to promote geography in lieu of an actual NCGS or National Conference on, Ge on Geographical Studies, which we conduct annually. Through this, we hope to highlight the different geographic researches being done by our fellow geographers and allies in the field. For this session, we, um, our invited speaker will share his research on port operations in Manila and from the registration link that we have provided, um, we did a word cloud of what the participants expect to hear from this lecture. Um, the top words include congested, chaotic, busy, dark, trade. Other words include macho, bigalig, critical, steel, cramped, and many, many others which altogether make it quite an interesting mix of expectations, which we hope could be clarified in this evening's lecture. On this note, I again would like to thank everyone for joining us tonight, and as always, I hope we have a very special and productive session. Thank you. Oni, you're on mute. Thank you, Professor Garcia. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker for our lecture for tonight. He is the PhD candidate in geography from the University of Carolina, North Carolina Chapel Hill, the Department of Geography. And he also was our visiting research fellow um, last uh, 2019 and 2020 during his field research for his dissertation on the production of space and the contested time of circulation at the Port of Manila. He is also a Fulbright student grant awardee. Who went in Filipino, our speaker currently teaches a class uh, called Society and Environment in Southeast Asia or Geography 266 at UNC Chapel Hill. Aside from his PhD research, Mike is also a co-editor of the recently published Feminist Geography Unbound, Discomfort, Bodies, and Prefigured Futures with Banu Gokaris, Gokarixel, um, Chris Newbert, and Sarah Smith, which was published by the West Virginia University Press. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Mr. Michael Hawkins. Hi, Mike. It's nice to see you again. Hi, Prof. Oni. <laughs> so, so maraming salamat kay uh, Prof. Oni Martinez, the Philippine Geographical Society, um, the UP Department of Geography, 
and of course, um, our radio DJ and president of uh, the Philippine Geographical Society, Sir Eman Garcia. Um, so is it okay if I, if I get started then? Okay, I'll share the screen, Mona. Doms, do I have permission to, to share the screen on this end? Um, Ma'am, let's try it again now. Ah, tama yan. Alright. Okay, so everyone can see yung screen share ko? Yes, pa. Yes. Sige. Um, well, salamat kay uh, Doms Omar Solo for the beautiful uh, poster of, of the talk, and I'll use this as the introduction of today's talk, Truck Bans and Truck Beds, The Politics of Waiting at the Port of Manila. In February of 2014, the city of Manila joined Navota and Caloocan in placing restrictions on cargo truck traffic and implementing a truck ban uh, during peak rush hour in an attempt to help decongest morning and evening traffic in the city. In the months that followed, the Port of Manila faced major congestion as truck drivers working now restricted hours rushed to both pick up shipping containers laden with goods from international markets and deposit shipping containers with exports that would make their way overseas. The congestion and reduced working hours further compounded the problems. As more and more trucks lined the highways waiting to enter the port area, the more crowded space inside the port became. Trucks idled both inside and Salabas, the port area, as the city's crane operators and dock workers became overwhelmed by the increased workload and the crowded container yards. The congestion, congestion lasted for months, threatening to complicate the busiest time of the year, the months before the Christmas holidays. By September of 2014, Mayor Joseph Estrada removed the truck ban and congestion decreased. In the weeks and months that followed, the Aquino government and the city's two port terminal operators, uh, meaning the sort of owners of the two main international ports, Asian Terminals Incorporated and ICTSI, implemented new policies to curb and prevent future port congestion. As I argue in this lecture, we can classify these two policy changes as looking to solve problems related to one, port space, and two, port time. Dahil tayong lahat ay geographers, ang unang policy change that I want to analyze is related to space. During the congestion, cargo trucks inside the port could not leave while the truck ban was in place. And thus, this prevented other truckers from entering the port area. A company official representing the port terminal and Asian Terminals Incorporated noted that the average dwell time, that is the average time a container stayed in the port area before being loaded onto a truck doubled during peak, court, peak, peak port congestion from seven days to 14 days. While a few extra days might not seem like too much of an issue, in reality, this was a major problem. Um, by doubling the dwell time, storage space decreased significantly, making loading and unloading even more complicated and thus slowing down normal operations even more. To remedy this problem of space, the Aquino government, working in partnership with port stakeholders, adopted policies that incentivized importers and exporters to move some of their operations to two additional ports outside Manila. Operators conducting business in the south were encouraged and incentivized to use the port of Batangas, while those in the north were encouraged to move some of their shipping and trans transport operations to Subic. Further, Port ownership promised to expand truck waiting areas and parking spaces where truck drivers could wait uh, in an attempt to get them out of the roads and out of the lines that congested the highways. Yung pangalawa policy change is related to oras, related to time, and specifically the management of port traffic and the streamlining of the pickup and depositing of shipping containers. Uh, after the port congestion, um, reached its peak, the two private port terminal operators implemented the Terminal Appointment Booking System, 
also known as TABS. TABS is an online booking system wherein truckers and their employers reserve slots and make appointments to pick up or drop off their cargo. As one trucking official would explain it to me in our interview just last year, the port terminal operators had long been planning to implement TABS and use the port congestion of 2014 as the opportune time to make the switch. As she explained, during the middle of congestion, ATI and ICTSI, again, the port owners, presented TABS to the government as a solution to fix the problems of the port and the problem of time. She emphasized, however, that in their presentation to the government and to port stakeholders like trucking officials, the operators concealed how TABS would introduce a new payment scheme to all port transactions. TABS remains in use today from its introduction in 2014. And as evidenced by the PowerPoint slide here and my conversation with the trucking official, TABS requires that a broker or trucking representative pay for each slot that is booked in the system, allowing a trucker to enter the port area at a designated time, but requiring a fee for each transaction. The sliding scale of payment charges 1,000 pesos for the best slots, that is those during normal working hours, while other slots cost between 300 and 500 pesos, and the system offers free pickup during off hours and even rebates or credits to users' accounts for the least popular times, like Sundays and early morning to incentivize companies to send their trucks uh, during traditional days off, like Sunday. Truckers explain that the introduction of these Sunday working hours disrupted time when they preferred to be bonding with their families instead of working and push them to work earlier in the morning as their owners were incentivized to seek out these free or even rebated appointments and tabs and to avoid the most expensive times. So if tabs monetizes the schedule and incentivizes work during non-traditional non hours and days off, ATI and ICTSI, the port owners, also make money from penalties uh, that is the late arrivals if a driver misses his pickup slot. Again, something that did not exist before 2014. As it monetized the pickup of containers and introduced a sliding scale, TABS completely replaced what used to be a just-in-time pickup system where truckers would continue to arrive to the port at any time as long as they had completed their pay paperwork and paid what were then standard and uniform fees. TABS also led to the return of the truck ban, although in a different form. Um, as many of you are aware, container trucks are not allowed to ply Metro Manila's thoroughfares during the busiest times of the morning and evening rush hour, from 6 to 10 a.m. and from 5 to 10 p.m. But there is one exception. If a truck driver has a TABS appointment during rush hour, he is allowed to be on the streets for two hours before and two hours after his booking, sa umaga and for two and a half hours before and after his booking, Sagabe. The purpose of this talk is to in part analyze the social consequences of TABS and the NCR-wide partial truck ban that remains today. So if that's the context noong 2014, I wanna briefly jump to 2020 when I did some of my field research um, and we can do that now. So just after the 2020 new year and a few months before uh, COVID would prematurely end the research and transform all of our lives, I hurriedly walked along Rojas Boulevard searching for Club Intramuros, where CTAP, uh, which is the Confederation of Truckers Association of the Philippines, was holding a rally. CTAP's members, part of Manila's largest trucking federation, had just days earlier declared a trucking holiday and ceased all their business operations in and out of the port. Um, the, primary, the primary concern, some of the drivers, was the mayor of Novotas' executive order stating that from 6 to 10 a.m. and from 4 to 8 p.m. Sagabe, all cargo trucks, including those with appointments in the TAB system, would be banned from the city's three main roads leading to and from the port. As we can see from the two pictures on this slide, um, among the most prominent concerns of CTAP on the tarpaulin to the right uh, and its drivers on this day were the Novotas truck ban and the continued use of the TAB system 
among other demands about MMDA regulations and wrecker policies that um, often tow trucks that are parked illegally. So if this lecture started with the port congestion not in 2014 and briefly analyzed how it transformed the trucking industry in the years after, uh, I now want to turn to a bit of the theoretical argument and the background of my larger project about the port of Manila, and then we'll come back to the present uh, and the fieldwork of 2020. So, Yung dissertation project Go investigates his historical transformations of the port of Manila and the changing social and political relations of work there in a series of key moments from 1898 to 2020. It narrates a 120 year historical geography of the port of Manila. Focusing on the city's waterfront, the project investigates moments that transformed the port's labor processes and remade its built environment. The ambition of the project to, to traverse and explore more than a century of political change remains bounded by its geographic focus on historical processes as they unfold on Manila's docks and piers, Submarap Pier at Pantalan. As an episodic historical geography, it analyzes key events in the port across four historical periods, American colonialism, Cold War anti-communism, crony capitalism under Ferdinand Marcos, and an ethnography of the contemporary port, which we'll hear a bit more about at the end of the lecture. So two broad research questions offer continuity across these seemingly distinct eras. The first question considers how and why the Philippine state often intervenes to transform or manage the work of transporting cargo during moments of political uncertainty or perceived crisis. So as example, the implementation of TABS in 2014. This question considers how governments attempt to secure political stability by remaking port spaces and remaking its labor processes. Um, it looks to make clear how the state-led production of waterfront space and investment in technology is envisioned by government authorities as a tactic to resolve historically specific problems. So the problem in 2014 of congested traffic, other historical problems at different points of analysis. So take the quote at the bottom here, for instance, from a Department of Transportation official from 2019, as they said, quote, a healthy port means no congestion, no delays in cargo delivery and stable prices of goods. A healthy port ensures a continuous flow of maritime commerce and an efficient container yard utilization. So from this quote, um, we see that the port takes on the status of a living person, one where smooth flow, the arteries and veins of trade, supposedly gives life to a healthy port, yung palusugan ng pantalan. If put in the context of quotes from other industry and government officials, a healthy port leads to a prosperous nation where progress and trade depend on this uninhibited flow of goods. As I want to show now, the production of space is a key strategy that governments use to ensure and reproduce the relations of economic circulation. So in the opening pages of his popular history of the metropolis, Nick Joaquin writes, quote, the site of Manila was reclaimed from the sea and the sea is still trying to get it back. Joaquin playfully refers here to the environmental processes carried out over millennia in which river sediment from the Pasig settled to provide the foundation for the city. In contrast to the geological pace of rivers and sand in the last century, Manila's coastline has been rapidly transformed and extended into the sea by human-led land reclamation efforts. So of course, in the past year, reclamation projects have been in the news, perhaps most notably with the now infamous fill of dolomite uh, along Rojas Boulevard, uh, a project allegedly carried out in the name of mental health during the pandemic, but as we know, uh, swept, about, swept aside with every coming storm, typhoon, and wave. But the story of land reclamation in and around the port area and around Manila has a much longer history, and some might say more interesting history than this dolomite effort. Early in the American colonial regime, U.S. officials identified the port as a site essential to the nation building project. 
on October 30th, 1900, Act 22 of the Philippine Commission appropriated $1 million for the improvement of the harbor. The commission called on the chief engineer of the division of the Philippines to solicit bids for the job through advertisements in major American newspapers. Uh, the official advertisement that was posted called on contractors to dredge an estimated 5 million cubic yards of material from the ocean floor to deepen the bay and the river. An estimated some 188,000 tons of rock would need to be quarried for the extension of harbor breakwaters, which protect ships that are anchored in the bay. The government awarded the contract to a firm based from New York City and work began in the ensuing years. The project itself in the early 1900s built on and appropriated unrealized dreams from this previous Spanish colonial regime. In this moment, about 1,000 workers were brought to rock quarries across the bay in Marivelas to entice workers to move to the remote quarries, which were often far removed from any nearby towns. The construction company subsidized housing for workers and their families, built a company store where they could purchase goods, and even constructed a sabong pit so workers could bet on cockfights during their days off. Construction on the port Again, both land reclamation and the expansion of port facilities and investments in technologies would continue throughout the next 120 years. If we were to write a history of the port, we could trace numerous moments of change to the physical space. We could map technological improvements of the 1920s and 1930s, which expand operations and built new warehouses. We could trace post-World War II reconstruction, uh, the removal of sunken Japanese vessels, which temporarily blocked the harbor, and the repair of most of South Harbor's piers, which had been bombed during the war. Or we could use the work of UP's Dr. Gerard Lico uh, in architecture to analyze the construction of the cultural center of the Philippines complex on reclaimed land from 1966 to 1982. For as Lico tells us, while well, the plans for expanding the city were first developed by Mayor Arsenio Loxon's Manila Committee on Reclamation, Port and Harbor Development in 1959, it was the First Lady and Ferdinand Marcos who built the complex to quote, glorify the state and communicate the ideals of the ruling power. During the Marcos regime, Lico continues, quote, altering the natural physiology of the Bay Shore by reclaiming land from the sea was a symbolic gesture, not only of its subversion of nature, but also of the impending social changes, especially the declaration of martial law in 1972, which led to dictatorial power over the social, political, economic, and cultural spheres of the period. Or if we wanted to tell this historical story of the changing port complex, we could perhaps narrate historically the privatization schemes of the late 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s, which saw the expansion of not just South Harbor, but the reclamation and construction of Manila International Containment Report managed by the private firm ICTSI, which still operates there today. The specifics of these construction projects and land reclamation projects throughout history are not all that important for today's talk. What's important then is that for more than a century after the quarries at Marivelas were dug and the Pasig River and Manila Bay were dredged, the port has remained as a continual site of investment, construction, technological improvement, and land reclamation. And thus it's in this context and this history that I now want to place the implementation of DABS, the computer software system designed to regulate truckers' schedules and the flow of port traffic. Much like the continual technological investments in the port throughout history and the expansion of port facilities via land reclamation, TABS seeks to stake a claim to control the times of port labor. So that is to argue that the production of port space and investment in technologies directly impacts labor time and the daily rhythms of work in the port. And while I don't wanna make you bored uh, it's a theoretical argument goal. I do want to highlight two books where many of my ideas on this relationship between the production of space and labor time come from. The first is Nefertiti Tadayar's Things Fall Away, Philippine Historical Experience and the Makings of Globalization. 
And the second is Henri Lefebvre's The Production of Space. If we take seriously these two books, a fundamental argument emerges. Continuous investment into port space comes to modify not only the built environment, but also the rhythms and routines of trucking labor. So Ayonsa, Jung trucking executive that I cited earlier with our interview in 2020, the port terminal operators um, had long planned to implement the TAB system, pero ginamit nilang crisis ng 2014 port congestion to a fully institute yung bagong system, TABs. If we think aside these two books, government officials and industry leaders will always use abstract numbers and conceptions of economic production. So sa halimbawa of these abstract numbers, measurements of annual tonnage of cargo shipped through the port, the average waiting time or dwell time of cargo inside the port, the billions of pesos of lost GDP as a result of port congestion, or the tens of thousands of trucks and their tracking of them that pass through the gates of the port every month. And they use these abstract numbers to justify port expansion and technological innovations. Such abstract sort of removed from human experience, conceptions of flow and trade necessitate continual reinvestment into an expansion of the port area. Here, alterations to space and labor processes are justified through the language of creating a healthy port. Put simply, the production of port spaces and landscapes and investment into these spaces in these abstract schemes aims to reproduce and secure the social relations of capitalist expansion and global economic flow. However, when we move from the abstract spaces and times of the port, something else is revealed when we focus on the concrete lived experiences and concrete labor times of port workers like truck drivers. Continuous investment into port space comes to modify not only the built environment, but also the rhythms and routines of labor, sapir, sapantalan. This affects a very specific kind of time the time required to load, unload, and transport goods through and out of the port, which is of course done and carried out by people. Thus, from this context and historical background, the second research question of my project asks how truck drivers experience, negotiate, and resist these efforts to remake the port in the name of efficiency. As governments intervene in the port area to secure political and economic legitimacy, the city's truck, truck drivers struggle to make their own personal and political claims to port space and the concrete times of their labor. So before fieldwork was interrupted uh, by coronavirus, uh, Madalas, I spent time in two main areas uh, for fieldwork. Uh, Sakaliwa, the seawall of the Manila International Container Port, uh, where I interviewed pahinante or driver's assistants. Pahinante are not allowed to uh, enter inside the piers while their driver is picking up a container. So madalas naglilipa sila uh, ng mga oras dito sa seawall, an area outside the main uh, terminal port area. And here they wait for their driver to return so that they can accompany them to the bodega or warehouse where goods are offloaded. The other place I conducted field work was inside the truck waiting area, Dito uh, Sakanan, where truckers, both those with and without appointments in tabs, pass time. During our interviews, two phrases were repeated over and over again. When describing the difficulties of the job, men often remarked, Habo sa oras, and nagpapalipas ng oras dahil sa truck ban when they were describing sort of what they were doing waiting in the port area. So ayon sa mga drivers at Pahinante, a large part of the job was spent waiting at bodegas and warehouses outside the city after they had dropped off their cargo. And I wanted to know why. Um, why did they always talk about the experience after dropping off cargo and waiting um, outside of the warehouses? What was it about this? So if trucks are allowed to drive during normal truck ban hours in the city with a TABS appointment exemption, right? So if you have this appointment, you're exempt from the truck ban. 
By the time they arrived to Laguna or Cavite or the outskirts of Quezon City, this exemption has expired. Or in some cases, the truck ban has just started after they've dropped off their goods. So dahil wala silang bagong appointments at tabs, it is restricted for them to return back to the city, back to their homes, or back to the port area. As one pahinante recalled on a recent trip where he and his driver had to wait in Laguna outside of the bodega uh, before they could return back to the city due to the truck ban, he spent his hours pay, playing, playing League of Legends in a nearby computer shop. So while this was a sort of humorous moment during our interview, it's important to note that drivers are paid cada viaje, so there's no money in waiting outside of the bodega. In an interview with a man that I'll call JR, a colleague of his showed me perhaps the best example of passing time uh, support area, having strung a, strung a hammock beneath the container van to both rest and escape the midday sun. JR lived in Nova Liches, uh, pero despite living in Metro Manila, he explained that he usually only goes home on Sundays, sleeping in the truck on those days, Monday through Saturday, when he does not return home to his, see his family, and emphasizing how difficult it is uh, to sleep in the truck, especially kapag sobrang inet. As we chatted, as we chatted, he recounted his journey the night before. After depositing a load along Quezon Avenue in the early morning, they arrived back to the port area at 4 a.m. to avoid the truck ban. As he put it, early mornings were best for not only the truck ban and thus the MMDA's ticket levying traffic enforcers, but also para iwas ang traffic. Um, other interviews with drivers revealed that JR's habitual sleeping in the port area was no exception. Drivers universally lamented how tabs, traffic, and truck bans made their lives more difficult as veteran, uh, veteran drivers remembered years before when it was possible to make one trip per day and sometimes two trips per day versus today after tabs when drivers can expect only about two to three trips cada lingo, which has all sorts of implications uh, when you're paid cada viaje. As we sat inside his cab, Sir Jojo, uh, as I'll call him, was fond of laughter, explaining that he'd rather just talk and make jokes with me then answering some of what he called my more serious questions, tungkol sa buhay, and the road, and his job. But as we conducted our interview, he opened up a bit and shared details. As he explained it, he had come to Manila um, to send money back to his family in Visayas, who, uh, with his salary, he's able to visit a couple times a year. Sir Jojo narrated that every night he sleeps in the truck nearby the Manila Hotel, paying a guard of the Manila Hotel a small bribe to ensure that he has permission to sleep there. As Sir Jojo put it, he only returned to his trucking company's garage in Bulacan once or twice a month where he could take a bath or sleep in a bed inside their facilities. Uh, during our interview, another driver in the cab next to us, we were sort of seated in a, 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 park, a parking lot, interrupted us and asked Jojo a question about a sticker on Sir Jojo's truck, which granted him access to manufacturing hubs in special economic zones outside the city. So this is a sticker um, on Sir Jojo's truck that allows him to pumasok inside um, certain special economic zones. The other driver was having trouble with the paperwork to secure his own sticker and thus enter these economic zones, which provided quite a bit of work. Jojo explained his own process for the paperwork, uh, giving the man hints about where to submit the documents, and soon the two moved on to another conversation, sharing shortcuts and the truck routes they use to navigate the city, avoid traffic enforcers, um, and make it to the provinces quicker with these faster routes. So as I work towards a conclusion of the talk, if these stories of chasing hours passing time and sleeping in the port area tell us something about the daily labor time, routines, and rhythms in the trucking industry, Jojo's paying of a small bribe to secure a slot near the Manila Hotel and his conversation with this man reveals something else. In an industry where tabs and the policies of the port operators, MMDA, and Philippine Ports Authority 
dictate most of the rhythms of the working day, drivers do engage in certain tactics and practices to recover some control over their working hours and times of leisure. This is of course not to celebrate the payment of the bribe Jojo paid to the hotel guard. Rather what Sir Jojo's payment to the guard and his sharing of shortcuts with the other driver as we talked out the window um, reveals is how despite the difficult circumstances of work, truck drivers in Pajinante can and do make their own claims to port space and port time to make the job uh, and their working lives more tolerable, more bearable. Sometimes this takes the form of collective action, like the CTAP protest and trucking holiday from January of 2020. Other times it is these more individual actions outlined here with the story of Sir Jojo. Thus, in concluding this talk, um, it is these that my project wants to pay attention to, these sort of small moments. If the Philippine state and private industry are making claims to control the rhythms and basis of port life in the name of profit through continual investment, land reclamation projects, and policies like TABS, how is it that drivers and their assistants reclaim their own personal and political spaces and times? If we pay attention then to what Nefriti Tarear calls, quote, remaindered lifetimes, that is, life-sustaining practices that endure in the face of global economic systems, um, if we pay attention to alternative ways of working, alternative ways of cooperating, maneuvering through the port, we realize always exist and are always accessible. This is to say that alternative claims to port space and time always remain embedded in the landscape, uh, just like the Dolomite Rock, no matter how many times the waterfront and its spaces of work are remade. So I hope this preliminary research presentation is at least a start to that project. Um, or maybe we'd be better served to thinking about some of these concepts to move away from the port and thinking about the reclamation of space through something like community pantries. Uh, so maraming salamat sa inyong lahat. Um, and again, thank you to the Department of Geography uh, and the Philippine Geographical Society for the chance to present this research. Thank you. Maraming salamat, Mike, for sharing the preliminary findings of your research and also for sharing your insights from your fieldwork. Although sabi mo nga kanina, nakat short yung fieldwork no, because of the pandemic. And also sharing some interesting and, uh, conversations with the drivers that you were able to interact with you in, at the port area. And so now at this point, we are ready to take the questions or, and read comments uh, from our audience. So you can use the chat box here in Zoom, or you can also post your questions sa uh, mga social media platforms uh, ng Department of Geography and PGF, the Facebook, and also sa live streaming natin at YouTube. Will there be comments or questions? All right, so merong comment, uh, Mike. For, for you or question here, how is collective action achieved by the drivers or and the pahinantes? No? Do they have an established group or community? Uh oh, so um, yung halimbawa ko kanina about CTAP, the Confederation uh, of Truckers of the Philippines, uh, meron silang, they have various industry groups like that who will represent um, the workers um, and, and advocate to some of the, the port ownership to sort of make some of these claims represent uh, workers. But it's also a story of in the bigger historical project, which I um, hinted at, but didn't get a chance to talk about. There's also a history of, of what used to be much stronger labor unions in the port area um, for all sorts of reasons have lessened in their influence today. So especially um, in decades past, we saw much stronger labor unions that, that could represent port workers. And for all sorts of reasons, those have declined a bit. So while we do see certain organizations like CTAP that are able to make policy changes and, and you know, uh, tweak the TAB system or um, you know, make comments and have dialogues with the port terminal owners uh, to make conditions a bit better for drivers. Um, labor unions as they may have existed in the 1950s, 1960s and 1970s have declined 
And I think that's an important part of the story. So thank you for the question. It's really important. Thank you. Uh, there's another uh, question. Um, is there another question? Sorry. If 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 it's okay, I'd also like to ask a question for Mike. Um, see, like I said, we started. You also had questions about um, how the goal of um, the administration, you know, um, those who are managing the port area, uh, controls or regulates the rhythm of, of, of work, of labor, of the truck drivers. Um, and so I wonder, because of course the goal of that is efficiency, but is there really, I mean, do with the tabs, are we able to see that the goal for efficiency is really achieved? And in what respect or in what ways? Okay, I think if we want to lobby for for a change because it's greatly affecting the drivers. On the aspect of efficiency, on the side of economic seguro that have has to also benefit naman at the the, those who are involved in the trucking business along and it's most especially the mga drivers, the mga pahinante, um, ano yung pwede natin, ano yung insights about the, the goal for efficiency and has this been achieved in, in some ways? Um, yeah, so I think um, thinking about uh, what are these sort of effects of tabs um, and all the other issues is kind of the, the central question that I always want to answer. Um, and yeah, so uh, I think the interview with the, one of the trucking officials revealed, um, you know, uh, in part that tabs certainly did bring about some of these good changes, but it also right changed some of the payment schemes. Um, and sorry, Mamoni, I sort of ramble a bit to answer your question, but uh, yeah, I think it's it's trying to make sense of, of this complicated thing where everything is done in the name of efficiency um, and certainly has brought some benefits, but also when we can look at, at uh, some of the effects of this, um, right, there are these, these other negative effects about uh, pushing people to work on Sundays or earlier in the mornings um, or waiting outside of the warehouses. And, you know, so it's sort of also looking to analyze the consequences of this. Um, and I think there's another question in the, in the chat about a similar thing that maybe I can read really quickly to figure out if I can answer both questions at once. I took, I can also read it uh, for the rest of the audience who could not see the comments uh, chat box. Um, one of the participants said, I appreciate very much for bringing out the impact of the truck ban and tabs on the welfare of truck drivers. I worked with the Bureau of Customs in 2014 and participated in many meetings and to think through solutions to the truck bans. I thought then and still do that tabs was the least awful response uh, to a big problem, whether or not they were there were truck bans. In your discussions with the truck drivers, did you come across alternatives? Yeah, that's a good question, which would be, which would have been better compared to that. Yeah, so um, Sir John, maybe you could even answer this question better than I could probably with um, some of the discussions you've had and, and working in the VOC. So as you're also aware, um, you know, the other problem is empty containers. So this is sort of half of the talk today focused on oras and on time, um, specifically around tabs, but as you identify probably even a bigger problem is, is empty shipping containers um, and how these stack up in container yards and contribute to congested port conditions. So, you know, when goods are offloaded, you have to do something with the shipping container and the way that, that you know, economics and shipping works, um, that empty shipping container, there's much less incentive to ship it out of the country or if, if exports out of the country aren't happening at the same pace as imports, the stacking up of, of these containers becomes a problem in the port area. So kind of the second problem I wanna analyze as I continue writing is the problem of space 
with empty shipping containers and how this also leads to congestion. So there's been all sorts of policies um, where John, as I'm sure you're aware, I, ATA, uh, ICTSI and ATI have built these gigantic container yards in Laguna in places outside of the city to deal with the problem of space and the empty container yards. Um, so maybe, you know, it would, you know, as I hope the, the actual written research can do, it can focus on, on how um, the problem of empty containers and the lack of space in the port area is maybe a bigger problem than tabs and oras. And John, I'd be curious to see if you agree with that, um, you know, what is, what is a bigger problem for the, the experiences of truck drivers? Is it tabs or is it the empty container problem and what that does for Bureau of Customs? Maybe we can talk later. Thank you, um, Mike. Uh, there are other questions here. One of our participants said, hello, thanks for the talk. Uh, if it's okay to ask, I'd like to know about how spending time away from their families affect, uh, affects ch child rearing. If you have encountered any uh, anyone with, the ch with children from among the drivers that you have uh, interviewed. Yeah, so Salamat Rochelle for the question. Um, yeah, so almost all of the, the workers I was able to talk to um, have families and um, you know, this was sort of one of my intentions to learn some of these more intimate stories, um, but you know, things were interrupted when the pandemic happened. So I didn't get to have a whole lot of conversations about this, but as I hope the talk revealed, um, you know, there were these very real experiences where you know, if drivers cannot come home uh, Monday through Saturday or Monday through Friday, right? That obviously has real effects on family life um, or Sir Jojo, as I talked about in the end, um, you know, talking about how rare it is for him to go home to Visayas um, once or twice a year, depending on how much money he's able to earn. So yeah, there's something about migration and even daily migration within the city um, and, and the way that, you know, the trucking industry disconnects you even if you live in Nova Liches or a different part of the city that you have to sleep in the port area or something. Um, yeah, it has a very real effect on those family relations. And while I don't know a whole lot more, um, you know, it was obvious that, that this was a strain on the lives of, of truckers in Pahinande. So it's a great question. Um, another question Mike uh, uh, can you comment on one of the prominent words that emerged in the word cloud, which Emman showed earlier, the port area, that the port area is macho and the port area, uh, or the port area as a gendered space? So this is in relation to what we saw from the word cloud earlier. Yeah, so I think that um, maybe the, the way the question was, was asked has an answer in itself. So it's definitely a very masculine space, a very macho space. Um, and you know, very gendered space. Uh, in in you know, one encounter that I remember with Sir Jojo is, you know, just the conversations that that we had. Um, it was you know very much these sort of macho masculine conversations, uh, which you know is probably deserves more thinking about. Um, what the effects of that are, but you know, in all sorts of cultural representations of movies or um, newspaper accounts of the port, you know, it is often young macho men, shirtless, um, with their muscles flexing. So I think that's a very real representation of the port, and and evident in the word cloud um, was going on and was happening in the conversation. So I'm trying to write a little bit about. Um, kind of my own masculinity and the masculinity of the truck drivers and how that affected some of our interviews and, and some of the jokes that were made. So it's, it's very real. And I think that's, you know, that word cloud is, is revealing a truth about uh, masculinity and masculine labor and the way that gender operates in work, right? And divisions of labor, um, important questions. That's also part of your research, Tamaba Mike, or you want to sort of uh, integrate that the, those observations as well? Yeah, maybe Conte, um, not as much a focus, but it, mm -hmm. it's always on my mind to think about gender division of labor and um, yeah, the way that masculinity is working, the way that masculinity facilitates some of the interviews. So while it's a big question, um, yeah, I don't know. I hope that's somewhat of an answer. Thank a lot you. going on in the chat here. 
Yeah, 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 right. Um, so John also commented that Manila and Navota city governments cared only about traffic in their areas. Yeah, PPA, port operators, and customs just wanted goods and trucks to flow. Um, yeah. And then there's also uh, another question. Thank you, John, for, for your comments. Perhaps um, you could uh, spend time with Mike also, and then you have you could have your conversation after this um, um, webinar. And siguro later, we can also ask John to talk more about his comments as well. Um, there's also another question no, um, from Mr. John uh, Abellera. Were there marked differences with how these men use the spaces of the port area in terms of their age and the places where they live in? Um, Salamat, John. And I think, yeah, one of the most interesting aspects is, is something that Tin then comments on about housing precarity um, that came up. So one of the most interesting aspects was the difference between those who are from the port area. So a lot of the drivers in Pajinante sort of grew up right along the Bay Shore and, and they found employment in the port. Um, and for a lot of those men, they were able to go home at night. So to go back to the question about family life, um, you know, almost all of the men, obviously, who, who were from the port area or from Baseco or something like that, could go home and did go home. They would leave their trucks, they would take the keys with them, um, and then they would be with their families. And then others, like the men I mentioned from Nova Liches or, or uh, Sir Jojo from Visayas, um, you know, very different experiences of migration and, and where they're sleeping. So uh, I think that was the biggest difference in terms of, of where people were from. Um, age, not something I, I thought as much about in the second part of the question. But yeah, I think Tin puts a great comment there um, for, for the way we can think about how geography then affects, you know, where people are, are sleeping and, and that sort of thing. All right, thank you. Thank you also, Tin, for, for your comment. Would there be other questions from our audience? Meron pa ba? We still have a few minutes. Let's see, we can take one more question. Otherwise, uh, if there are no more questions, um, thank you to everyone who uh, posted their comments and, all your, um, and their questions as well so at in social media and here in our chat box Zoom. Um, as I said, no, hopefully we, we look forward to continuing this conversation with Mike. Um, perhaps later we can um, entertain some, some more. Uh, and start some conversation pero uh, after the program, yeah. And so at this point, um, if there's no more question, we'll be uh, proceeding with uh, the next part of the program um, where we will be awarding the certificate of appreciation for our guest speaker for tonight, for Mike, for sharing his valuable insights and expertise in this uh, webinar. Right, so Mike, thank you so much again. And allow me to read uh, the certificate of appreciation that um, the Philippine Geographical Society in partnership with the Department of Geography is giving you, who are doing it tonight for sharing your valuable insights and expertise as the virtual speaker for the talk truck bands and truck beds, the politics of waiting at the port area as part of the Philippine Geographical Society Lecture Series 2021 held on April 21, 2021. Uh, this is signed by um, Professor Joseph Pagli, the convener of the PGS Lecture Series, and also by Professor Yanni Lopez, the chair of the Department of Geography, and also Professor Yaman Garcia, the president of PGS. So again, Mike, maraming salamat for, for your time. Maaga po ngayon sa kung nasaan si Mike no sa sa US and uh, very early siya nag-prepare for to be able to join us tonight. So, really thank you for the time, Mike. Right? Yeah. 
thank you, Mamoni, and, and thank you to the um, Philippine Geographical Society and the department and, and Mamioni, uh, Mamioni Lopez and, and everyone. So thank you so much. Um, and I hope to see you all again in person soon. But um, see what that looks like. Thank you. Thank you. We are also eager to see you again soon after the pandemic. And with that, we are almost at the end of our program. Uh, and we'd like to call on now Dr. Darlene uh, Gutierrez, a member of the faculty of the Department of Geography, to give the closing remarks. Okay, thank you, Oni. Uh, walang katapos ang pasasalamat ito, Mike. No? Thank you very much for that excellent presentation and for sharing your research with us tonight. Thank you too for bearing with us. We know that it's a bit early for you there, but we appreciate your time to be with us here. Konti uh, lang sasabihin ko, no? So that we can finish the program. Uh, I would just like to say that from your lecture, no, uh, I, I believe that a healthy port means a healthy economy. So my question is, how healthy then is our port? Okay, so I want also to thank everyone for joining the uh, Philippine Geographical Society lecture series and for sharing your time with us tonight. We look forward to seeing you again in our next lecture on, uh, is it next week, Oni? Do we have another one next week? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, so see you all again next week and maraming salamat and ingat po tayong lahat. Okay, thank you. We'll be announcing um, the activities then. Thank you, Ma'am Darl, um, mm -hmm. for the succeeding weeks. No, um, So some of the announcements would be our call for uh, membership. So for those who are interested to join the Philippine Geographical Society, at para hindi lang dito sa webinar tayo nagkakaroon ng interaction, uh, please um, check out we do have a website, no, the Philippine Geographical Society, and you can also get in touch, no, with, with the members of the society um, uh, to ask to inquire uh, on the membership, and also there will be because it is a series of uh, no, webinars. Ah, yeah, okay. So there is also a feedback form. You can see it at uh, the slides, not in, but Telet also posted the link to. Uh, our feedback form. Uh, we're hoping that everyone who joined us here will be able to uh, respond to uh, the feedback form and send it uh, in, at your convenience, right? And also we will have uh, our succeeding lectures and webinars. And if you want to check out the previous, correct by Eman, um, previous uh, webinars, you can just search for that uh, through the UP Department of Geography YouTube channel. Again. So every, every, the past four, correct, webinars have been uploaded there. So pwede nyo siyang balikan in case na hindi kayo nakajoin ng mga previous sessions natin. Right? And uh, what other announcements? Do? Okay, so uh, we must have seen from the Facebook post, uh, we have our, our alumni, no? Um, and some of our students led by Andy Tabinas, Miko Tamura, David Garcia, and also joined by the PH Mapping Community are helping to map out the community pantries in the country. You must have seen the Saan Yan um, PH na page sa Facebook. Uh, please, if you haven't, uh, please check that out. The mapping team also includes myself, Ian Lopez, Christy Garcia, and Carlo Felipe. Uh, we're inviting everyone to visit the Facebook page and also the GitHub page uh, where you can participate in mapping the community pantries across the country. And also, um, tomorrow at 6 o'clock, we will have a mapping party. Um, this will be hosted by Saanyan PH. Uh, we'll start at 6 p.m. So do watch out for the Zoom link for the event, which we will post sa saan yan, PH, FB page. Okay. 
And for our next um, webinar, we'll, we are uh, grateful for Pavitra Vasudevan uh, for uh, agreeing to speak no, for the next webinar, which is entitled An Intimate Inventory of Race and Waste. This will be on the 28th um, at 10 30 in the morning. So hopefully, uh, marami makasali pa rin sa atin no, uh, sa next uh, webinar natin. Right? So, would there be other uh, announcements? So, if we're good, um, before we end this session, we'd like to request our participants to kindly open your camera and prepare for the group photo op before we end our webinar for tonight. Hey, everyone. At the count of uh, 37, Mike. No, at the count of three, OK? <laughs> OK, at the count of three. One, two, three. OK. All right, let's go to the next uh, page, OK? All right, so. To the next page, here we go. One, two, three. 